open call. Then we're going to take a short break. Um, and then, uh, so let's talk a little bit about open calls. So remember, there are three main types of mass collaboration projects that I talked about. Um, the first that we just talked about was human computation. There you have an easy task and a big scale. Here with open calls, you have a different problem. You might not even yourself know how to solve this problem, but you imagine that someone else might know how to solve it. So this is a kind of task, rather than giving this task to an undergraduate, you might try to go and talk to one of your colleagues about. So this book, how many of you have read this book, Longitude, by Davia Sobel? No? Oh, this is such a good book. OK, I, t I totally recommend this book. It's an example of one of the first open calls. Um, it was from the UK in the 1700s, I think, a long time ago. Uh, and they uh, had this problem that they wanted to know how to measure the longitude of a ship at sea. And this was a very important problem for the United Kingdom because it had military importance that warships needed to know where they were and where they were going. And also for commerce, ships were sort of just getting lost at sea. And so they wanted to, the government needed a solution to this problem. They opened it up. Many people thought the solution would be an astronomical solution, that by looking at the stars, you would sort of be able to figure out uh, what your longitude was at sea. That was the main focus of a lot of the research at the time. And it turned out that the solution that ended up being the most successful was a solution that involved actually having a very accurate timepiece that could work on a boat. And so by measuring, now we're way, this is like, I'm not an oceanographer or, or um, navigator of a boat. But something about you can see what, where you are when the sun is directly overhead. And then if you have this clock correctly, you can figure out what your longitude is. So the solution in this case, the point of this story um, is that this is a great book. And also that the solution to problems may come in unexpected places and in unexpected ways. And if you can have a problem where it's clear what you want to do, you can be open to novel and unexpected solutions like a clock. Um, so here you need to be working with problems where solutions are easier to check than they are to generate. And there are um, certain problems like this. So this comes up actually some in cryptography. So if I give you two very big prime, uh, so if I give you a very big number and I tell you find the prime factors of this number, that's very hard. But if you give me two big prime numbers, I can multiply them together and see whether that equals the bigger number. It's very easy to check. It's very hard to uh, actually generate the solution. And there are lots of, we, generally, social researchers don't think about problems like this. But I think there are problems like this. And to the extent that we can formulate our problems like this, we can be open to these unexpected solutions. Um, one beautiful thing about this is that the standards then are not about interestingness, let's say. They're about whether you can actually do the thing that solved the problem, right? So can you build a battery that will run this machine for 100 hours? Then it doesn't matter if you can get up and give a wonderful talk and get everyone very excited about your work. It just matters whether you can actually do the thing that's important. So I think that to the extent that social science is focused on interestingness, then this We've all been at talks where people can give an amazing talk. It's like, wow, that was really fascinating. That was interesting. It was such an unexpected result. And then afterwards, you're like, mm, I don't know that that actually really solved any problem. It's just a beautiful talk, right? And so I think that um, these open call problems have us give us an opportunity to move away from this high charisma social science to a social science based on actually doing stuff. Um, the other great thing about these open calls to me is that they actually allow you to show that you are making progress. So social scientists have been doing research about many things for a long time. 
I think we've actually learned a lot, but imagine trying to talk to a congressperson, and congressperson says, I'm really interested in education, let's say. And you say, well, social scientists have been doing lots of research about education. The congressman says, okay, well, have you solved any problems? And you would say, well, we have many journal articles that are excellent. Uh, and they'd be like, okay, well, have you solved any problems? And it's true that we've learned a lot, but it's very difficult for us to demonstrate that learning to other people. So compare it to, for example, the DARPA challenge with self-driving cars. So they set up this challenge and they said, okay, you have to drive, you have to have your car drive itself through this obstacle course. And the first year, most of the cars didn't make it. And then the next year, more cars got further, and the next year, more cars got further, and there was actual demonstrable progress. And so if there are very clear goals that are easy to verify, then we have the possibility of making progress. Uh, one, I actually have created an open call research project, which you all are going to participate in in a few hours. Um, and one of the questions that comes up about that project, which is called the Fragile Families Challenge, is, is this really research? Like some people said, Matt, you're not really doing anything. Like, you're not actually building these machine learning models. Um, and the way I think about it is, like, are we actually trying to make progress on a problem? And if this effort leads to progress on a problem, then it is research, even if it doesn't look like what people normally think of as research. Um, OK? Any questions about open call projects? I didn't give an example, because we're going to have an extended example uh, in a few minutes, and you all are going to get a chance to participate in it. Yep, Catherine. So I was kind of wondering about this charisma-free social science concept, because I think, at least in machine learning, I see a great pressure when we apply machine learning algorithms to social problems to come up with some sort of explanation of what's happening. And often people prefer an inferior algorithm that's intuitively understandable to one that works well. And in your experience you know, running these projects yourself, what do you think about the trade-off between you know, making progress on knowledge by being able to explain something versus just being able to predict something effectively? Mm, OK, well, this will definitely come up much more when we talk about the Fragile Families Challenge in detail. Um, I think that. Um, Interpretability is not, I would not associate interpretability with charisma. I would say interpretability is potentially very important for thinking about robustness and stability of these machine learning models. So if you build a machine learning model that makes certain predictions, and if those predictions don't seem to make any sense, given our understanding of the world, then I'm less confident that those predictions will work well in a completely new data set. Um, and I'm less confident that they will work well six months from now or a year from now. So I think the desire to have something that's understandable um, is potentially related to thinking really about performance if we generalize what performance means. Uh, I also think that for certain high stakes decisions, the desire to have something that's interpretable is very natural. So for example, if you go to the, this is an example I've heard, imagine you go to the doctor, the doctor says, okay, I'm going to do surgery on you tomorrow. We have to do surgery right away. And you're like, well, why? And the doctor says, well, this is what the algorithm says. Right? That is not, I mean, that, you, right, you can make all the argument, oh, that algorithm is correct. It's been well validated and so on. But like, for certain things, if you can't actually explain it to people for high stakes decisions, I think there are potential concerns. And finally, I will add a third thing, which is that the new GDPR, the new sort of European data protection standards, I believe they have in them a requirement for explainability for certain high stakes decisions. And so the desire for interpretability also in that case is driven by law. So I think there are a lot of reasons that we might be concerned about interpretability because it's actually important for performance in a more general sense uh, because it's important for people to have confidence in what you're doing, and it's potentially the law. Other questions? Thanks. Um, 
A lot of social science isn't often formulated in this, like, I've got a goal, how do I accomplish it sort of style. It's more uh, basic research, I guess you'd say, if it were hard science. Um, and I wonder if you have thoughts about how to convert or reframe questions that are you know, common in social science into this sort of tangible goal outcome. I mean, you, Federal Families Challenge is one example, yeah. but, but other sorts of things in that vein. Yep. You know, how do we get them to look like this? And are there things that we don't want to look like this? Okay, so I'll, the first question, how do we get things to look like this? So I'll give um, another example that I uh, actually was just thinking about yesterday with your um, survey activity. So one way to do it, let's imagine we were studying um, questionnaire effects in surveys. And so the way that it's often done now is people come up with these effects and do studies of them. And so another way would see, OK, we're interested in question order effects. So we're going to open it up. And anyone, we want you to find the pair of questions that has the biggest possible question order effect. Everyone can submit their questions. And we'll run 100 of these questions on a survey, and we'll see the size of the question effects on all of these. And so what might come out of that, um, we might have a much different understanding of question order effects if we try to think about sort of maximizing them. So I think anything that can be turned into a maximization where there is a clear metric, then you can start to see who can do the most on that metric. Now, what are the kinds of things where we don't want to do this? Uh, that is a great question. I don't know the answer. Um, but I would say, um, I guess I would frame it a little differently. Maybe I'd say like it, a lot of like theory building and understanding is not easy to come through this process of maximizing some metric. But potentially trying to maximize that metric leads to more theory building. So I don't think often, so in the Fragile Families Challenge, which we'll do in a minute, some people say, we don't really care about this predictive task. And I could say, I understand that. I can see why people might not care about it. But in the process of doing this predictive task, we actually have to solve a lot of other problems that you probably do care about. Like we have to improve measurement. We have to improve metadata for the survey. Uh, we have to build better theory about what things are important. And so I think we wouldn't want all research to be like these competitions to move some metric. Um, but that can be a part of doing the other kinds of things that we're currently doing. Is there a question from the live stream? Yes, this is from Helsinki, um, Finland. So moving from charisma to something we can measure sounds to me like money ball for science. Is that a good development, or does that direct our focus and ideas of science towards um, something that we want to have? It's a great question. Um, I never thought of it that way. Um, and a baseball question from Helsinki, too. That's really cool. Um, so I definitely think there is a possibility that this could Assuming everything turned into a metrics-driven competition, I think that would likely be bad for social science. But I think we are nowhere near that point. Uh, and so I guess if I was going to advocate for something, I would advocate for a few more of these. And then we can be a little bit more clear about what is gained and what is lost. Um, but I think we're nowhere near kind of overshooting the mark. I'm not worried about that yet. It's Question? Is that working? OK. And so in thinking about these three types of mass collaboration, it seems to me that like open call is like set aside from the other two in terms of um, as like an early career researcher, do you think that um, open calls make sense? Or, do, or is, am I thinking of, am I maybe limiting the possibilities to say that that's yeah. the case? OK, so I think there's two questions about, there's two questions there. One is about organizing an open call, and the other is about participating in an open call. So I think organizing an open call um, as an early career researcher could be difficult um, because it can be difficult to create something that people want to participate in. Uh, and that is. So I think there's a real chance that if you wanted to create an open call, 
people might not end up participating, and then you've spent a lot of time on something that didn't lead to something. That, that's a real concern. Participating in open calls, I think if they're well organized, um, there's no reason that you wouldn't want to participate in an open call as an early career researcher. So if they're organized in a way that acknowledges the contributions of people, then participating in them can be great. So for example, in the Fragile Families Challenge, we had prizes. Um, the people who did really well got, we have a prize winner here. Amen, hi. Uh, so um, they were able to you know, put this on their CV. We also had opportunities for people to publish, both collectively. So we had one, we are, we are working on one paper where everyone who makes a meaningful contribution will be a co-author. We also have another opportunity. We have a special issue of a journal. And everyone who wants to submit a paper about what they did can submit to that. And so there are multiple opportunities for people who make meaningful contributions to be recognized for those in the way that scientists are usually recognized for their contribution. So that was a big part of how we designed the challenge. And I think if they're well designed, there's no reason not to participate. And, and I just add one thing, and they're kind of fun. And you learn a lot of new stuff. So I think that by doing them and comparing how what you do it works compared to what other people do, it's a great opportunity for learning. And I think we are now out of time. And we're going to have a coffee break. And we will meet back here in a few minutes. Right? We're going to do another one? <laughs> All right. When do we have our coffee break? Oh, good. OK. We're going to do another one. <laughs>